Hey everybody, this podcast is sponsored by and brought to you by Trifecta 2. That's my new trading system that comes out on May 1st, 2014. You can check it out by clicking on some kind of link in the show notes on the description of this YouTube video. And now let's get to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, everybody. My Mac is in the shop, so I'm sitting here recording the podcast at my desk on my phone. So if you detect an audio quality issue then, and you don't want to listen to this podcast, then well, I'd say it's perfectly fine with me. I don't, I don't really want to listen to this podcast. So thanks to Scott Welsh for uh, filling in on the podcast for the last couple of weeks. It took a couple of weeks off just to think about... Uh, my life and podcasting. I didn't really think about podcasting at all. You, you probably, you probably don't care what I thought about during my little mini vacation. Hey, look at this in the New York Times. Even as a number of indicators point to better economic times ahead, the chairwoman of the Federal Reserve, Janet W. Yellen, reiterated on Wednesday that she expected interest rates to remain very low until the recovery is on a more sure footing. And the American economy is more fully involved in involving available workers and other resources. And that's what she said the other day on Thursday, April 17th. And uh, I think it's uh, about every single analyst on Twitter that has ever looked at the currency market for like more than one half of five seconds was uh, pretty gigantically sure that this meant that the U.S. dollar was going to get crushed. And at least initially, that's exactly what happened. Um, but I actually took a sell trade on the British pound U.S. dollar right around that same time, and that trade turned out okay. And I'm back in that trade again. And I'm, I'm beginning to wonder if any of this business of uh, central banking really means anything, or if this is just a way to waste more trees and uh, that's pretty much interesting. Hillary Clinton's running for president, as you knew 25 years ago. It was a simple question to someone accustomed to much tougher ones, says Mark Landler and Amy Chotzik of the New York Times. What was her proudest achievement as Secretary of State? So I, I think as far as economics is concerned, you know, we're, we're on the tail end of an Obama presidency, and we're kind of coming into a new one. And if you've been frustrated by the regulations in the currency market or in the trading space, I think you're probably in for a, a, a reasonably good time since Jeb Bush is going to be the next president of the United States. Hillary Clinton is never going to win the presidency in a thousand years, even if I do decide to vote for her. And I'd be thrilled to vote for a woman or anybody that is qualified, of course. And I think she's perfectly qualified. You might hate her guts, but she's no less qualified than any of the other jerkwads that has been president over the last 25 years. And um, But she's not going to get elected president. It's never going to happen, not in a million years. Jeb Bush is going to be the president, and he's pretty much middle of the road, but uh, leans toward anti-regulation. So I think all this uh, disgusting intrusion on our financial privacy and whatnot is probably on the way out or on its last legs. I think some of that stuff can be unwritten, especially since a lot of this regulation never ends up having its intended purpose served. Of course, the whole intention of all these financial regulations was so that we didn't have any economic problems anymore, which is super laughable and pretty much the stupidest thing I ever heard in my life. We're going to prevent we're going to prevent financial catastrophe with regulations, just like we did all of the other times that we passed a bunch of regulations which preceded the next catastrophe. So uh, welcome to Earth, legislators. Regulation doesn't pretend, prevent catastrophe. People do. But people don't, so there always is, and there's nothing you can do about it. Cut to zombie apocalypse. Speaking of which, at the time that we have that zombie apocalypse, I'm going to run out into the street and I'm going to get myself bitten, preferably by the woman that lives a few doors down. 
All right. Uh, for those of you wanting some special encouragement for your trading, this is not the uh, podcast for you. In fact, you're probably going to get super depressed at what I'm about to say. If you want some encouragement and you would like to be encouraged and you'd like to hear something encouraging, you'd like someone to tell you that everything is going to be okay, which it probably is actually, despite what you're going to hear on the podcast in the next few moments, I would recommend that you go to robbooker.com. That's my website, and that's actually me minus the dot com. I'm just a regular guy, but I do have a website, and on that website, there is a form that will pop up, and it will show you an email subscription Yahoo Majigger, and you can actually put your email address in, and you can get an encouraging email from me five days a week sometimes, three days a week sometimes, two days a week if I'm particularly lazy. And I'm sending out a lot of encouragement because I think that all of you have been let down by most of the trading education world, which basically takes you for a complete loser and an idiot, and I don't do that, um, despite what I'm about to say, actually. Or you can go to robbooker.com slash mail, M-A-I-L. Don't go to M-A-L-E. That's a bunch of pictures that were taken of me in college. Don't judge me. I was poor and I needed the money. You can't do this. That's the subject of today's podcast. I'm Rob Booker. I'm Dark Rob Booker. Welcome back to the listeners. Well, welcoming you back, but you're probably welcoming me back. This is your podcast. I'm just your host. Thanks for listening. Let me talk about why you can't do this for those of you who are motivated by being told that you cannot do it. Eventually, I'll put a video up of the recording of this podcast as well. I'm wearing headphones, but uh, actually, there's no... Actually, I don't even think these are connected to anything, so it just makes me look more professional. You can't do it. You're too inexperienced to be able to trade successfully. You trade like a gambler, and you're probably going to lose all your money. Your family will leave you. Your children will be embarrassed. Your partner will softly ask you to come downstairs to watch television one night. But trading is a leech sucking the blood out of your relationship, all of your relationships. So you decline the television invitation, and then the after-television living room floor romping, and now you're as distant as a junkie. And it all happened so fast you can't remember when the screen time became more important than listening to your formerly favorite person in the world tell you about Debbie in accounting who is such a bitch and how she wanted to bring a pig to work one day. And who has a pig for a pet? You can't possibly trade successfully, podcast listener, when you've abandoned your societal responsibility to be a good and loving and present partner to your partner and father or mother to your children. In fact, you eventually stop going downstairs at all because you know it's just going to be another why didn't you do the dishes conversation. You stop talking like a normal person about the weather and box scores and if gluten really does cause disease and how many pounds your best friend is trying to lose. You can't even gossip about your neighbors anymore, gosh darn it. You don't go downstairs because when you're not in front of the monitor, you're in front of your phone. Quotes on your monitor. Quotes on your phone. And you can quote me on this. You are juvenile in your obsession with trading. You're Bella, distressing about whether trading wants to kill you or kiss you. And the sun shines in through your office window, and instead of marveling at the hot star that we circle giving you life, you just see the shimmer off of your 27-inch Thunderbolt display, like beams of sunlight off Edward Cullen's chest. And you can't take your eyes off it even. And you're caught in the trading porn industrial complex. So you shouldn't quit your job. Your job is your lifeline. And it's what standardizes your social performance to the rest of Earth's now rampant fascination with puritanical Western worth work ethic culture. And it stretches from Beijing to Buenos Aires to Boston to Brussels. You work hard so you can pay the bills, and to be idle is to be evil. Work is the new religion, 
And if you're not working to take your company public, then you had better be working very publicly. Your work product is the price of acceptance from your neighbors. And to quit your job is to throw away the chance that you can chum around with your neighbor about your employer's contribution of up to 9% of the blood you spill on the conference room table into your 401k. If you quit your job, you will lack for income. You'll be less of a man or a woman. You'll have abdicated your responsibilities as a provider. And what will you do if you fail? Asking what happens if you fail is another way of saying, <laughs> you're sure to fail. And if you stay at your job, we're all saying that you have no chance of failure. That was never true. But somehow we've accepted it as such. Well, no chance at failure, except you will have failed to do what you really want to do in life. Don't you realize that the highest honor you can bestow upon yourself comes when you hold up your dearest dreams on the altar, on the Mount Moriah of the American business model, and you stab said dreams through the heart and there is no ram in the thicket, and you walk down off the mountain without your Isaac, and you realize you can't even face your job anymore, and those dreams, even if they were only dreams, were actually the only thing keeping you at work in the first damn place. So you go back up the mountain and you kill the job too. Man cannot live by responsibility alone. Just making the bread isn't going to sustain you. But no one tells you that. Those who have sacrificed their dreams are the ones left with all the time to tell you to do the very same thing. Oh, with such vigor do those who lack the joy of fantasy attempt to kill your happiness. It is true that misery loves company, and big companies are breeding ground for misery. When the sweat of your brow drops for the realization of someone else's dream, you destroy more self-respect than you can ever lose by risking your own failure by doing something that you want to do. But good luck finding someone brave enough to tell you that. The ones who tried and failed are shy. The ones in the middle of it are too afraid of jinxing themselves by talking about it. And the ones who succeeded? Well, where the hell are they? I'm Rob Booker. You're listening to The Traders Podcast. <laughs>